So tonight I was asked to speak about anger, which was a good topic because this is one thing I know a lot about through personal experience. Um, so sometimes in, in Buddhism we sometimes say that there's three personality types uh, and everybody is one of these three types. So advanced warning, they're all bad. So there's th three personality types. Uh, the greed type, the hate type, and the delusion type. So three types. Uh, so historically, I've usually been a hate type. Um, so of course, everything is impermanent and subject to change, including your type. Uh, but generally speaking, when we reflect on our mind uh, over the past few years, we usually see that one of these three types is more dominant than the others. So how do we normally react to situations? Do we normally react by looking for what we like and obsessing about what we like, obsessing about what's pleasant and enjoyable? Uh, or do we normally fixate on what we dislike, what we hate, what annoys us, or what we don't approve of? Uh, or are we usually mixed up and confused or spacing out or daydreaming or thinking about butterflies and unicorns or uh, not really here at all? Uh, or are we just making up weird stories in our head that have nothing to do with consensus reality? Um, so generally speaking, when we reflect on our own mind, we can see pretty clearly what our type is. Or if you reflect on your mind and you can't tell what type you are, then you're probably a delusion type. So that also <laughs> clears things up pretty easily. Um, and it's not that any one of these is any better or worse than any other. They're all bad. Uh, so the only person who is not any of these types is a fully enlightened being. So a, a Buddha or an Arhat uh, it cannot be defined as a greed type, a hate type, or a delusion type. They're just enlightened. Uh, but the rest of us have defilements. Uh, so defilements are the flaws and imperfections uh, that we habitually engage in. Uh, the destructive uh, emotions, destructive thoughts uh, that we habitually uh, strengthen and uh, participate in. Uh, and we do this out of, uh, again, not understanding. Not understanding the true nature of mind. Not understanding mm, the path to awakening. Not understanding what happiness really is. Uh, so through not understanding uh, what in Pali we call avijja, uh, so avijja uh, literally means not knowing. So no vijja, vijja means knowledge. Uh, so avijja, no knowledge, no understanding. So through not understanding uh, the nature of the mind, through not understanding what true happiness is, we engage in all kinds of defective, flawed ways of uh, thinking and feeling and interacting with the world. And we call these ways uh, defective. We call them defilements or taints or, or flaws uh, because they cause harm to ourselves, they cause harm to others, and they prevent the arising of wisdom. So one of the primary defilements that we talk about is anger. Uh, so anger fits under the aversion category. Uh, so broadly speaking, we categorize defilements under three major categories. So the greed category, which is any kind of desire-seeking kind of mind. Uh, the aversion category, which is any kind of um, rejecting, disliking, kind of mind, uh, and the delusion category, which is that spacey, confused, um, misunderstanding uh, state of mind. So anger fits under the aversion state of mind. Uh, and in fact, uh, the word that I'm translating here as aversion, uh, in Pali it's uh, dosa. Uh, dosa, which interestingly enough also means flaw. Uh, but here it has the meaning of aversion. Dosa is also sometimes translated as hatred uh, or as anger. Uh, so anger, uh, then, uh, when we look at it more closely, uh, what do we see as its main quality? You know, its main quality is aversion. You know, its main quality is a, a disliking or a rejecting of something. Uh, 
uh, of a, a judging of something as being um, inappropriate or flawed or wrong. Uh, and part of what makes it so challenging to work with anger is that often that judgment is correct. Uh, like somebody does something harsh or rude to us, and we recognize that was harsh. Harshness is unwholesome. Harshness is inappropriate. So there's actually a correct judgment there in that we are recognizing this is not right. Uh, or in the case of injustice, uh, like maybe you hear about uh, religious persecution, like a minority religion being uh, unfairly persecuted by a government in another country. Uh, and you think, oh, that's not right. That's, that's evil. That's inappropriate. That shouldn't be happening. So that's a correct judgment. Um, that's actually a manifestation of wisdom. So knowing right and wrong, knowing wholesome and unwholesome, knowing good and evil, that's a function of wisdom. So that's correct. But then we make the mistake of getting angry about it. We, get the, we make the mistake of being angry at the people who are doing it, or angry at the situation, or angry at the social structures that allow it to happen. And we don't recognize that this is an error, uh, that anger is itself unwholesome, is itself harmful, is itself destructive. Uh, and that it's not a necessary step uh, in the, the process of knowing right and wrong. Uh, so, for example, a Buddha can know that something is unwholesome but would not be angry about it. Uh, a Buddha can see somebody doing something harmful, but a Buddha would not be angry at that person. Uh, in fact, if anything, a Buddha would feel compassion for them. He would recognize this person is causing suffering for themselves and others. So a Buddha would feel compassion, recognizing that this being is suffering. Uh, and so uh, a Buddha would wish for them to be free of that suffering. So that's not, not an attitude of anger. Uh, it's an attitude of wisdom and compassion. So the wisdom of knowing uh, that the action being done is unwholesome, harmful, and uh, knowing that it's causing suffering, combined with the compassion of wishing for that person to be free of that suffering, wishing for that person to be happy and wise. So uh, I've jumped directly to uh, a very sticky point in talking about anger. Uh, because it's, again, it's, it's quite clear uh, that anger is unwholesome. It's quite clear that it's harmful and destructive. Uh, so when we look at the mind state of anger, uh, when anger is present, when we examine it and look at it, then we can see immediately that it's an unpleasant, unhappy state of mind. It's a disturbed, agitated, uh, awkward, painful experience to be angry. Uh, there is a certain pleasantness there. Uh, so the Buddha calls anger uh, the honeyed tip with the poisoned root, uh, which I, I find deliciously evocative. Uh, so just think of a plant, uh, and the part that you can see uh, is sweet, it's delicious, uh, but the root is poisonous. So you pull it up and you eat it, and you take those first few bites and you're like, oh, I love this, so nice, but then you feel sick. That's what anger is like. You're like, oh, I hate this person so much. I'm so pissed at them. And then you feel sick because you've poisoned your own mind. Uh, so that's exactly what we're doing when we engage in anger, when we participate in the activity of anger. Uh, we're latching on to that, that sweetness uh, on the surface of anger. Uh, but then we're poisoning our own mind. We're hurting our own mind. Uh, another simile the Buddha uses with anger is fire. Uh, so the Buddha called greed, hatred, and delusion the three fires. Uh, so in, in later uh, Buddhist tradition, they've come to be called the three poisons as well, which is, again, like the simile of the poisoned root. It's a perfectly valid way of, of talking about it. Uh, but I find this description of the three fires particularly evocative. Um, so what is the nature of a fire? Like, if your head was on fire, what would that be like? Would that be a pleasant, enjoyable experience? If your body and mind are burning up 
on fire. Does that sound particularly nice? No, no, not particularly nice. In fact, it sounds quite unpleasant. Does anybody here want to be set on fire? Anybody? Any volunteers for immolation? No? Okay, then don't get angry. Don't participate in anger. Uh, so I should also clarify. So we also say things like, don't get angry. And you might say, well, I can't do anything about it. The anger just arises. It just comes up of its own accord. It's not my fault. Um, and there's a limited degree of truth to that. Uh, because some of what arises in the mind is an echo of past activity. So I've said this many times. Um, so some of what appears in the mind uh, is arising as a result of past mental activity. It's not happening intentionally. It's not volitional. Uh, it's something which appears in the mind. But then what we do next is entirely up to us. Uh, so when we see the anger appear in the mind, then we have a choice as to what we're going to do. Uh, are we going to strengthen that anger or are we going to let it fade away? Are we going to embody that anger or are we going to remain peaceful? Are we going to speak angry words or are we going to speak peaceful words? Uh, are we going to perpetuate that anger or are we going to let it die out? We have a choice. Uh, so we don't need to embody every single emotion that appears. God, that'd be so exhausting. Um, we also don't need to identify every emotion as being who we are. That would also be terribly exhausting. So you're just sitting here and like happiness appears and we think, I am happy. Sadness appears and we think, I am sad. Anger appears and we think, I am angry. Depression appears and we think, I am depressed. God, so exhausting. Just quit it already. Just see these things floating through the mind and you'll discover this vast reservoir uh, of serenity and clarity which is not affected by these objects floating through the mind. Uh, so we can do the same with anger. So when anger arises, there's no need to inhabit that anger. There's no need to own it. There's no need to embody it. There's no need to perform any action based on that anger. Uh, so, again, reflecting on the inherently harmful nature of anger, recognizing that it's painful and unpleasant to ourselves uh, when we engage in anger, when we participate in anger, and also reflecting that it causes us to do things that are harmful to others. Uh, who here has ever said or done something while angry that you later regretted? Pretty much everybody, okay? Do you see the danger in anger? It causes problems, doesn't it? Uh, so acknowledging that, acknowledging that when we're angry, our wisdom is clouded, our judgment is weak, we make bad choices, we say harmful things, we do harmful things, we do things that we later regret. It's like being drunk. It's like being insane. Uh, it leads to us making very bad choices. Uh, and one of the particularly dangerous things about this is that when we are in the altered, intoxicated state of being angry, we often know, right now I have the courage to say this thing that I would normally never say. Right now I have the ability to do this thing I would normally never do. Normally I would never say to this person, you are a wretched jerk and I don't want to see you again. Normally we would never say that when we're in our right mind. But when we're angry, then it's like, Ooh, now I can say this. Yes. Ooh, at last my chance is here. And then we say it. Uh, so don't listen to that crazy thought. Don't believe that crazy thought. Remember your conscience. Remember that we still experience the consequences of our choices. Later on when the anger fades, we still will experience the consequences of those harmful things that we said. Uh, we'll still experience the consequences of those harmful choices that we made. So reflecting on the danger uh, of anger, the danger of allowing anger to obsess the mind, allowing anger to dominate the mind. We don't want to give anger any foothold in the mind at all. Uh, so again, we can see this pretty clearly uh, with the ordinary kind of anger. 
uh, like your, well, anybody here actually drive? Only one person. OK, I don't, I guess I can't make driving analogies. I should have learned that by now. Three years in New York City, and I still try to make driving analogies. Um, mm, OK, maybe you're trying to get in the subway car when it's really packed, and then somebody squeezes in in front of you, uh, and you can't fit on the train. Uh, and anger arises. Uh, and, and we recognize, OK, this is foolish. It's foolish to be angry. Um, so again, ordinary anger we can see. Uh, to some degree, the foolishness of it. But what's more challenging is the feeling of righteous indignation, righteous anger. This is what I was pointing out at the beginning of this talk. When something happens that we know is wrong, something happens that we know is unwholesome or harmful or evil, uh, and we think, I am right to be angry about this. Uh, so again, maybe you read about some terrible government policy that's going to make a lot of people suffer, or already is making a lot of people suffer. And there's a lot of examples of that, so I'm sure you can think of a few. I can think of a lot, and I don't even read the news. Um, or, or maybe you get laid off uh, unfairly, uh, or maybe your partner is being really mean to you for no apparent reason. So you have some reason to be angry that you think is justified, that you think is right. So let's put that a little bit differently. Today I've decided it is correct to poison myself. Today I've decided that the right course of action is to set myself on fire. Today I've decided that the right course of action is to torture myself. Does this sound like wisdom to anybody? Does this sound wise? Does this sound like a good idea? No? No? Um, so I just found out about a government policy that is totally evil. So I'm going to start stabbing myself in the leg. Does this sound like wisdom to anybody? No. This is exactly what we do with righteous anger. We think somebody else is doing something unwholesome, so now I am going to also do unwholesome things. Namely, create anger, strengthen anger, inhabit anger, participate in anger. So we're just compounding the evil in the world. We're piling more evil on top of the pile of evil, which is the world has enough evil. It doesn't need more. There's already more than enough bad stuff happening. We don't need to be part of the problem. And that's what happens when we engage in righteous anger. We're just contributing to the problem. We're putting more anger into the world. When anger is what's causing so many problems in the first place, hatred, resentment is causing so many problems. Why do we want to contribute to the problem? So the irony here is that with righteous anger, it's actually coming originally from a wholesome state of mind, which is that wise recognition of right and wrong, that wise knowing of wholesome and unwholesome. So we're starting from a very good place, which is conscience. Uh, and often there's also, uh, with that, there's compassion. So it's recognizing that these evil, unwholesome things that are happening are hurting people. And we want those people to not be hurt. We want them to be free of suffering. We want them to be treated fairly and justly and appropriately. So these wholesome motives, conscience and compassion, these wholesome mind states. Um, and then we poison it by dumping anger on top. We poison it by wrapping in this hostile, hating mind. Uh, we poison it by building up in ourselves the same destructive uh, emotions that led to the very thing that we despise, that led to the very thing that we find inappropriate, uh, that caused it in the first place. Uh, and we can see this. Uh, we can see how uh, caught up in righteous anger, caught up in righteous indignation, we make exactly the same foolish choices that we make in any other state of anger. Uh, not only are we making ourselves miserable, but then we engage in speech that is hostile, speech that is unkind, speech that is inconsiderate, instead of speech that is loving and thoughtful and caring. We engage in activities that are hostile and harmful and damaging, uh, instead of activities that are, that are uplifting, that are peaceful, that are serene. And we also give a bad name to our own cause. Uh, it's like, uh, I believe the world should be free of angry people. Well, 
Does that make any sense? To be angrily demanding that the world be free of anger? Uh, to be hating the people who are hating? Uh, no, it's just making, again, it's making ourselves part of the problem. Uh, so it's important to recognize that, to look really closely at uh, any time we try to justify anger. So in Buddhism, there is no such thing as justifiable anger. It's all unjustifiable. It's all unjustified. It's all unrighteous. There is no righteous anger. There is only unrighteous anger. It's all unrighteous. There is no righteous indignation. There is only unrighteous indignation. So just being really clear on this. Um, but also being very clear that this does not undercut our wisdom. This does not undercut our ability to know right and wrong. You can still know that something is wrong without being angry about it. Uh, instead, you can choose from a place of kindness and compassion to try to enact a solution. From a place of genuine kindness and concern for the beings harmed by these unwholesome actions, um, you can try to do something about it. Uh, so Buddhism does not advocate inaction. Uh, Buddhism advocates doing wholesome acts of loving kindness with body, speech, and mind. Not just mind, also body and speech. Uh, so that does actually mean if we have the ability to alleviate some of the suffering in the world, then we do it. Body and speech. So use your body. Go out there and do something to alleviate some of the suffering in the world. Speech. Talk to people. Uh, talk to people who can join you uh, in your cause of trying to bring more goodness into the world. Uh, and of course, mind. It always starts with mind. It always starts with cultivating loving kindness and compassion within our own mind, uh, of cultivating self-awareness and self-restraint within our own mind, uh, but not staying just with the development of mind, recognizing that the development of mind must be accompanied by development of body and speech. Uh, if loving kindness exists only in our mind and not in our speech and actions, then our loving kindness is very weak, very minimal. If compassion is only in our mind and it's not reflected in our actions and our words, then we don't have very much compassion. Better than nothing. Uh, but there's a lot more to be done. And also what we tend to find is that we, as we engage in actions and speech, based on loving kindness and compassion, that then those become much stronger in our mind. Uh, it becomes that much easier to develop and maintain an anger-free mind, a mind with no anger, with no hatred, with no aversion, with no hostility. Uh, so again, the Buddha spoke over and over again about developing wholesome mind states through actions of body, speech, and mind. Uh, so really working to bring it uh, into all of our all of our activities. Uh, so it's it's not just sitting on a cushion. Uh, it's also doing active things in the world uh, that make the world a better place. But doing so without the taint of anger, uh, doing so without the stain of resentment or aversion or irritation in the mind, uh, because that just poisons everything we do. Uh, it doesn't make things better, it just makes things worse. So really working uh, to yeah, be, be a positive force for good in the world, but to do so with a wholesome mind, uh, a mind that's free of anger. Uh, so an important element of letting go of anger, by the way, is forgiveness and understanding. Um, so when we're angry at another person, Recognize that what we're angry at is not that person. We're angry at their defilements. We're angry at their greed, hatred, and delusion. A person is not their defilements. In fact, a person cannot be found. All that can be found are shifting impermanent components. But that's a conversation for another day. So a person is not defined by their defilements. So. There's no such thing as angry people. There are people who are engaging in anger, but there are no such thing as angry people. Do you understand the distinction? Okay? 
There are people who have anger, people who do angry things, people who say angry things, but there are no angry people because all people are subject to change. All people uh, can become different. People are not defined by the choices they make because they can always make different choices. So recognizing when somebody does something inappropriate, something harmful, something unwholesome, uh, even something abjectly evil, recognize that they are doing so because they are delusional. Uh, they are lost in their own harmful, self-torturous mental habits. They either don't understand that those habits are causing them suffering, or they have not developed the willpower and the self-restraint to control themselves. And in either case, the proper reaction is compassion. Oh, this poor person, they're so delusional, they don't even see they're hurting themselves. May they develop the wisdom, the wisdom to know better. Or, oh, this poor person, they've not yet developed the samadhi, the concentration, the self-restraint uh, in order to control themselves, uh, in order to prevent themselves from doing harmful things. Oh, how sad. May they be well-developed in mind. May they develop the self-control to restrain themselves, to keep themselves away from harmful activities, to keep themselves pure from unwholesome mind states. Uh, and recognizing that we ourselves engage in harmful actions when we are not wise, when we are not self-restrained. So when we see others engaging in unwholesome patterns, we can know at some point in this beginningless string of life after life after life, I have done exactly the same thing. I was in exactly the same delusional, defiled state of mind as that person. I made exactly the same mistake as they did. So I recognize where they are because it's not different from where I was. I have made the same mistakes and if I don't purify my mind, I will make those mistakes again. So it also reminds us to work on our own practice. Uh, when we see others engaging in, in inappropriate, unwholesome conduct, it reminds us that if we're not careful, we'll do the same things. We've done it in the past, we can do it in the future if we don't work on our practice, if we don't develop uh, our own morality, uh, our own concentration and our own wisdom, then we'll wind up in the same situation again. Uh, so developing this understanding, forgiving attitude, uh, both towards others and towards ourselves, and strengthening our resolve, uh, strengthening our determination uh, to continually purify our own minds and to do what we can to help others, to do what we can to assist others in the path. This is another thing that the Buddha spoke about over and over again all throughout the suttas, uh, the importance of helping others, uh, to not just purify our own minds but also to speak to others in praise of purifying the mind, uh, to do what we can to help others uh, in their own practice of self-development, in their own practice of moving towards awakening, in their own practice of developing wisdom and compassion. Uh, so through this then, uh, watching the mind, every moment watching the mind, watching the mind, uh, and the moment we see anger uh, arise in the mind, we recognize this is anger, this is not wholesome, there is no justification for this anger. I will not participate. I will not get involved. I will let this anger fade away. And it's also a reminder. My mind is not yet pure. There is more work to be done. I need to make a strong effort to purify my mind. I need to make a strong effort to develop loving kindness, to develop compassion through body, speech, and mind. Uh, I need to make a strong determination to develop the concentration and the insight to know the root of anger, to see the underlying foundation uh, which produces anger in the first place. Uh, I need to develop the strength of mind 
to start to tame my subconscious, to start to train my subconscious so that it stops producing anger in the first place. Uh, so making that firm resolution. Uh, and also knowing, knowing that we're going to screw up along the way. That's to be expected. How many times have we screwed up in the past? Countless times. How many times are we going to screw up in the future? Probably a lot. That's okay. As long as we keep strengthening our resolve, as long as we keep our determination, uh, as long as we keep pointing the mind towards awakening, uh, then we'll make fewer and fewer mistakes. We'll learn from our mistakes, and we'll do better, and we'll keep moving forward. Uh, until eventually we can experience a mind which produces no anger at all, uh, a mind which is completely free uh, of all defilements, a mind which is completely peaceful, wise, uh, and loving, uh, a mind which is not obstructed uh, or hindered uh, by any defilements or delusions. Uh, so it is possible. Every single one of us uh, has the capability to attain a perfectly pure and wise mind. It isn't easy, but it's possible. Uh, so knowing that it's possible, we make that resolution, that determination uh, to move towards that uh, every step of the way. So those are a few words that I have this evening. Uh, any questions or comments? Any thoughts? Yes. Do you feel like it's possible to get to a place where you can stop yourself from feeling anger without being Buddha? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Is that your, um... I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> But I get angry a lot less often than I used to, and it's much less intense, and it lasts a much shorter time, uh, and I'm much less likely to make bad choices. So I've seen in myself a lot of improvement by following the Buddha's teachings. So I know it's possible. Um, as for attaining it without becoming a Buddha, yeah. Um, so there's two main maps of the path between a completely untrained person and a fully enlightened person. There's two main maps. So the map we use in the Theravada system is that of the, the four stages of awakening, uh, which is also called the, the eight kinds of, of, of noble people. Uh, the system that we commonly use in the Mahayana is the ten stages of the Bodhisattva, the ten Bodhisattva stages. Um, so with both of these, at a certain point, before full awakening, you reach a point where the mind is free of anger, where the mind is irreversibly purified of the tendency towards anger. But it takes a while. So you don't worry about how long it takes, you just work on it. Um, basically, it's all those moments when you see it arise and you tell yourself no. Just keep doing that. And keep sharpening your awareness so that you catch it sooner and sooner. And eventually you'll see what it's coming from. You'll see the basis which the anger is arising from. And then you can remove the basis. You can uproot the root of anger. But that takes time. It takes effort. It takes resolution. Uh, so often what we're working with is, uh, first off, it's cleaning up the stories in our mind. So we have a lot of stories which we use to justify anger. So the first thing is cleaning up those stories by reflecting that anger is never justifiable, it's never appropriate, it's always harmful. Uh, so once we've cleaned up those stories, then we work with anger on the level of feeling. Uh, so looking at the feeling of anger and recognizing it's poisonous. It's destructive. Uh, it blurs wisdom. Uh, it's not something that we want in our mind because it inhibits the path. It's counterproductive. It's backsliding. So working with it on the level of feeling, uh, then we start to abandon it more and more. Uh, and then we work on it at the level of, of direct insight. Uh, and for this, it's necessary to have very strong samadhi. 
the mind must be very stable and focused, very bright, alert, and still uh, to be able to see the foundation uh, from which anger is arising. Uh, and then we apply the main mm, techniques of insight, uh, which are recognizing that that foundation itself is impermanent, uh, impersonal, uh, and not, uh, it has no self-existence. Uh, it's conditional. Uh, it arises based on conditions. It ceases when those conditions change. Uh, so recognizing that the base of anger is impermanent, so it's not always there. It shifts and changes like everything else. It's impersonal. It's not who we are. As I said earlier, there are no angry people. Uh, so recognizing that uh, the, the anger is not who we are. It's not an indelible component of our being. It's not uh, an unchangeable part of our personality. Um, and recognizing that it's conditional. So it only appears under certain conditions. And when those conditions change, it disappears. Uh, so that means it doesn't have uh, a solid, real existence of its own. Uh, it's only present when we allow it to be present. So it's starting to recognize that we are the ones who planted it there in the first place. And it's only there because we keep replanting it over and over again. Um, so is it annuals or perennials that die every year? I can never remember. Annuals? Annuals, yeah. So anger is like an annual. Uh, we keep replanting it in the mind. And then we wonder, why, why is all this anger always blossoming in my mind? It's like, well, because we, we keep planting it there. You just stop planting it and it dies. Uh, maybe it continues for a little while, uh, but it dies as long as we stop planting it. So when we reflect that anger is conditional and that we are the ones who keep creating the conditions for its arising, then we stop planting it in the mind. And it dies out, it dies out, fades away. Okay? okay. Anything else? Uh, I have a question. Uh, you said that um, we should take action as well mm -hmm. to help others. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. wondering if you don't, if especially if you don't feel that you have the necessary wisdom to make the judgments to give advice or to take action towards something or someone, is it wise or fine to just continue to, to let them be, let, let it go and continue working on yourself? So that's uh, an example of, of risk management, you might say. Um, so you're weighing the drawbacks. Um, because the truth is that until you're a Buddha, your wisdom is never purified. So you will never clearly know with absolute certainty what the situation is. Um, but if we think in that way, then we will be paralyzed. We will never do anything at all. So we make a decision. We decide, uh, do I think I understand the situation well enough to do something wholesome uh, without causing too much harm? And if so, and check your motivation, check your intention. This is actually the really critical part. Check your intention. Is my intention actually one of compassion uh, and not coming from something else, not coming from greed or self-centeredness or anger or resentment or jealousy or, or anything else? So first check your intention. Make sure it actually is compassion. Um, then try to develop a clear understanding. Try to develop some wisdom uh, and knowledge of the situation so that you can make an informed choice. And then do the best you can. Uh, so that's the, the optimal condition. And acknowledging to ourselves, I am not enlightened, which means I am delusional, which means there's a chance this is going to go badly despite my best efforts. So acknowledging that right from the start. Um, and then if things do go badly, well, at least you tried. Uh, so your intention was wholesome. And karma is intention. So you had the wholesome intention of compassion, the wholesome intention of trying to know what the best choice is. So that's the intention of thoughtfulness. Uh, so thoughtfulness is an extremely wholesome mind state. So consideration, extremely wholesome mind state. 
Um, so this is, uh, some people uh, has, have heard the term idiot compassion. So that's compassion without consideration. So it's doing something from compassion, but not making any effort whatsoever to think about whether or not what you're doing is actually helpful or harmful. So it's important to make that little extra effort of really considering uh, if what we're doing is actually helping things or harming things. Um, yeah, but then we make, our, we make our effort to do something good uh, and see what happens. And then we learn. We learn from seeing the results. So that's one option. Uh, the other option is if we're really not clear what's helpful and what's harmful, then in that situation, sometimes the best thing to do actually is not to act, but rather to watch and learn and try to understand. So here, the important thing is the compassionate intention to inform yourself so that in the future, you can make a well-informed decision, so that in the future, you can be helpful. Uh, so this is not the same as apathy of like, well, I don't know what to do, so forget it. Well, that's not wholesome either. Uh, that just, that's just a more subtle form of aversion, a more subtle form of ill will. Uh, but rather, there should be that wish of like, I want to help, but I don't know the proper way to help. So I'm going to try to find out so that next time I can do something helpful. Uh, so it's like, this time I'm not going to do anything because I might do the wrong thing. But I'm going to try to find out what the right thing is. Um, in that way, then you'll move in the right direction. As long as there's that intention uh, to learn the right course of action. Does that clear that up? Great. Okay. Anything else? Any other thoughts? Is it possible that you are mislabeling or misidentifying what's coming up as an anger and it's not really happening? That's possible because we're delusional. Uh, which means that we often don't see things clearly. Uh, so it's also important to clearly look at your own mind. Really try to find out what's going on in there. Uh, because on some level we know. Uh, we know what we're feeling. Often what makes things confusing is that we might be experiencing multiple emotions simultaneously and it's getting kind of blurred together. But as we develop samadhi, uh, as we sharpen and focus and stabilize the mind, then it becomes easier to piece out the different components of our experience. It becomes easier to see what's going on. Uh, and also easier to see that we actually do have the ability to drop the unwholesome parts without dropping the wholesome parts. But yeah, sometimes we're really just muddy and confused inside and we're really not sure what's going on. So often in that case, the best thing to do is stop whatever you're doing. Take a few deep breaths, settle into the feeling of your body, focus on your feet, and then turn your attention inwards. It's like, well, what is going on here? And just watch, see what it is. Uh, and sometimes what's going on is confusion. And if that's what it is, then just be aware. This is confusion. This is what it feels like. Uh, but not, not flinching away from it, not ignoring it, but paying full attention to whatever you're feeling, even if it's not very pleasant. Uh, we need to know what it is. Uh, when we don't understand our inner experience, that's when we make bad choices. So the more clearly we understand our inner experience, the better equipped we are to handle it, the better equipped we are to make wholesome choices. Does that help? Is there something missing? An incident at work. Mm. And it was so uh, 
solid that my mind was just trying to get away from it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. creating all these scenarios, whatever they are, it doesn't matter. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it just, the whole evening was just creating scenarios and trying to come back and creating scenarios and trying to come back and um, I, I was you know, trying to do this to get away from it or trying to do that or maybe I could do something like that or maybe I could do this or maybe I should have soda or maybe I should like, like all these options came up and I was like you know what so I just sat down to just read a magazine just something completely just next time read a Dhamma book and uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I felt it little by little easing and the, the tightness in my back, just little by little. And like in an hour or so, it was like I was a completely different person. Mm. And then I tried to look again, and you know, I was still afraid. The mm. fear was still there, but in a different, in a different, a little softer. Mm. Yeah, so that's actually a good example. Uh, and that uh, a lot of unwholesome mind states kind of blur together at the edges. Uh, and often they arise simultaneously. So it can be difficult to tell what is actually going on inside. Uh, so we do whatever we need to do in order to get that internal clarity uh, of knowing what's happening. Uh, and uh, again, recognizing whatever it is, it's not me. Not me, not mine. So you see that stuff in the mind and you know, that's not me. It's not who I am. It doesn't define me. It doesn't control me. So this is quite difficult with strong emotions, uh, but it can be done. Uh, and in fact, as we train ourselves with milder emotions, then we start to get the skill to do it with more intense emotions. So just in the course of our practice, if we're practicing sincerely, uh, then that, that sort of stuff starts to iron itself out. Uh, it takes time, of course. Uh, but that, that tends to work itself out in time, as long as we're, again, sincere uh, in our willingness to investigate what's going on. Uh, and that means being willing to feel it, whatever it is. If there's anger, be willing to feel it so you can know what it is. If there's fear, be willing to feel it. So you can know what it is. We have to know what these things are in order to do anything about it. We have to be willing to acknowledge their existence before we can let go of them. So there's one person I know who uh, every now and then this person gets quite angry. Uh, and then with tension and anger and hostility will say, I'm not angry. <laughs> And it's like, mm, sure, yeah. Um, are you sure about that? Uh, of course, I don't say these things to this person because that wouldn't help. Uh, but it's acknowledging that sometimes that's what we do. We're not willing to face the facts that we're angry. More accurately, we're not willing to face the facts that there is anger arising in the mind. We're not willing to face the facts that there is fear arising in the mind. Uh, so the first thing is acknowledging, yeah, it's here, it's here. This is anger right here. But it's not me, it's not permanent, and it doesn't control me. Yeah, this is fear right here, but it's just <coughs> this much. It's just an object moving through the mind, just like a sound moving through the ear. The sound is not the ear, the sound is a sound. So right now there's fear moving through the mind. Well, fear is not the mind. Fear is fear. The mind is the mind. We are not the fear. The fear is just something moving through the mind. So we start to get some insulation around those things. We recognize that the, the anger or the fear is just this small object within this vast space, this vast space of peaceful, serene awareness. It's not our whole world. Sometimes what happens when there's a strong emotion is that we feel like our entire world is fear. Our entire world is anger. But that's not the case. That's just an object within the mind. 
And the mind is vast, unbelievably vast. And there's just this little object floating around in it for a little while. Uh, we don't need to act as though that's the whole mind. So taking that step back from it, seeing it clearly, but seeing it as not permanent, not me, not mine, not who I am, not something that I need to strengthen or hold on to. But also not something that I need to push away and reject. Because that just leads to willful self-ignorance. So when something arises, it arises because of causes and conditions. And it will last until those causes and conditions are worn out. So you can't necessarily destroy something that's arisen in the mind. All you can do is cease participating in it, cease feeding it, and it will fade away, but not necessarily immediately. But as long as we're not participating, that's okay, because then it no longer has any hold on us, it no longer has any effect on us, because it's not who we are. It's just something passing through the mind. Okay. Uh, anything else? Um, if you come to a situation where um, you see somebody is doing a mistake, and then will it still be considered a wholesome act if you um, step forward pointing out that person that is doing the mistake? Uh, if you know that that's going to make him angry? Hmm. Yeah, there's actually a sutta about this where somebody goes to the Buddha. Uh, it's actually a, a prince, Prince Abhaya. Uh, so Prince Abhaya goes to the Buddha and says, would you ever say something to somebody that was displeasing? Uh, and the Buddha replies, um, there is no straightforward answer to that question. Uh, and, and then the Buddha goes into more description. Uh, so the prince had a, a, a child with him. He had a baby. And the Buddha said, do you love that child? And the prince says, of course I do. And the Buddha says, well, what would you do if that child put a stone or a stick in its mouth? And the prince said, well, I, I would take it out. Uh, and the Buddha said, well, what if you couldn't get it out easily? And the prince said, well, then I would pin the child down and I would force its mouth open and I would dig in there with my hand and pull out the stone or the stick. Um, even if it hurt the child, uh, I would pull out the stone or the stick. Uh, because I care about this child. Uh, and the Buddha says in the same way, sometimes out of compassion, he will say things to somebody that is displeasing to that person. Um, that said, the Buddha also gives some very pointed specific advice uh, about when to admonish, uh, how to criticize somebody in a wholesome way. So he gives five things to reflect. We actually chant this every morning at, at our monastery um, because it's really important. Uh, if you're going to criticize somebody, it should be done properly or else we just make things worse. Um, first off, ask yourself, is it true? Second, consider, is it beneficial? Uh, in the sense that, is this going to help this person become a better person? Um, third, is it the right time? Uh, so uh, we have a saying in monasteries, never criticize somebody right before lunch. So that's a great example of the wrong time. <laughs> um, so being sensitive. Uh, another example is, generally speaking, don't criticize somebody in front of a group of their friends. That's usually a bad time as well. Uh, so being careful uh, that it's a time when what you're saying is going to be received as best as possible, when a person is likely to be receptive to what you have to say. Uh, and that can be challenging. So sometimes you just have to do the best you can, even though maybe it's not the perfectly right time. Um, let's see. Truthful, beneficial, right time. Uh, mind of loving kindness. Uh, so to uh, make sure that your mind uh, is, is gentle. Um, make sure that your mind is, is filled with a genuine wish 
uh, for that person to be happy. Uh, so that we're not speaking with, with hostility or irritation or anger or malice. So if there's any irritation or annoyance in your mind, that's not the time to criticize. Wait until your own mind is peaceful. Wait until your own mind is, uh, is gentle and loving again. Um, and the fifth advice he gives is to speak gently, not harshly. So then when we communicate it, instead of being like, you screwed up, I can't believe you did that, that's so wrong. Instead it's like, friend, uh, I really feel I should point out to you that what you did the other day was, was not appropriate. Um, let's try to do it better next time. So speaking gently, this is a really important one. All five of these are really important, actually. So if you don't meet all five conditions, probably better not to do it. So try to make sure you meet all five of these conditions. So truthful, beneficial, right time, gentle, loving kindness. Those are the five conditions. OK? okay. Well, we've run out of time for today. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, I mentioned